What's going on everybody? Culture Dog Sam Hatch back here with another series of videos. A shorter series this time than my 80s one that I dropped recently. Uh, this is just a little idea that Anthony W. Uh, sent my way. So shout out to Anthony uh, about doing some sort of informational series on Laserdisc audio. And I get these requests a lot, particularly you know, finding out what your player is capable of and how to implement it in terms of playback, how to hook up all these different audio outputs that Laserdisc is you know, capable of throughout its multi-decade lifespan. And it's a very, very complicated subject. I had been working on a proper uh, episode of my Laserdisc Essential series, all about the history of audio on Laserdisc, and that is like copious uh, and, and in-depth, and I've done tons of research on it, but it requires like a full-time amount of concentration. And uh, if I do that, then everything else on my channel kind of falls by the wayside. So it it's unfortunately only been worked on in dribs and drabs. And I figured Anthony was onto something. Let's just get out uh, like in the trenches, quick and dirty, you know, not for dummies, but yeah, Laserdisc Audio for Dummies series. Uh, something quick, easy, and hopefully helpful for some people because this stuff comes up a lot. And there's people getting into Laserdisc, uh, um, you know, fresh on a regular basis. Anyway, so yes, Laserdisc started in 1978 and kept going for quite some time into the 2000s. And along those years, the audio format of it um, evolved and the technology of it evolved and even video. I mean, you know, when Liz just started, it was always analog video, but it was straight, you know, four to three composition. And then eventually letterboxing came in as a, as a way to find uh, new avenues of recreating artistic compositions from theatrical exhibitions on disc. And, uh, then later on, they even, you know, had squeeze anamorphically enhanced laser discs, like much like DVDs were formatted for 69 TVs. So in those same regards that the video was very interesting and cutting edge as the, the format progressed, audio was even more so. Uh, when it started, it had analog stereo audio uh, to match the analog video, uh, though a lot of discs were in mono, but you could have stereo. And um, then eventually digital sound came on, on board in the mid 80s. And that changed the game quite a bit and there was you know Dolby surround that you were able to decode with ProLogic uh, decoders and your receivers, etc. And you know surround sound was a pretty cool thing for quite some time. And then in 1995, Dolby Digital brought 5.1 to home video, and uh, Laserdisc, you know, kind of evolved into a whole new creature. And then a few years after that, DTS dropped their 5.1 variant and created a bunch of discs that are still sought after today. Uh, so all of that is like a pretty interesting, um, you know, evolution in terms of audio. And yes, there's uh, going to be some formats that you will not be able to play depending on what your player is or, you know, depending on what's in your receiver. Uh, so we're going to go over that quickly and then I'm going to do an episode on each of the kind of major sound formats and, and how to hook them up and all that sort of stuff. But in this episode, I just wanted to kind of go over the basics. So yeah, when Laserdisc dropped, it had analog audio and I don't have a lot of older players. I'm assuming there's some older, like, you know, goofy connections to TVs, much like with old video games, you know, those little switch boxes, that sort of thing. But at least with the players I have, if you want to listen to the analog audio, albeit in, in stereo or, or mono or in surround. A lot of this stuff was uh, encoded with the matrix surround. We'll get into that in the next episode. Um, but yeah, if you just want to listen to that, all you needed was just a stereo jack. A lot of times it was just two stereo RCA jacks. So that's pretty simple. You know, that comes out of your player. You listen to it in stereo. It sounds great. If you have a surround decoder and you have surround movies, you know, that sounds great as well. So so far so simple but then came the invent of digital audio and digital audio being kind of piggybacked into the laser disc format it caused a lot of uh, kerfuffle uh, especially phillips uh, they were keen on rebranding the entire format uh, and calling it cd video uh, and then 
<laughs> you know, Laserdisc for years often when it had digital audio on it would have the little CD video logo just to confuse consumers like crazy. Um, and that's, you know, not to be fully confused with the CD video little five inch discs that were available, which was more of its own little format. It would just be a couple CD tracks and then there would be a Laserdisc track with a video on there as well as a bonus. The technically they were still Laserdisc, but they were CDVs or CD videos. Anyway, so digital audio changed things greatly because then from 1984 on, players started implementing digital audio on them. So if you have some newer discs, maybe say DTS or something that take advantage of that digital audio track, your old players, uh, yeah, they're not going to be able to play it. Yeah, and your uh, SOL, as the kids would say. So if you have an older player, your, your audio options are going to be limited for sure. So from 84 on, it depends on the level of the player because there's some entry level players that only have analog uh, out. So that's like your red and white plugs that are on the back of everything. CD players and you know VCRs and DVD players, etc. Uh, so that's analog. Even if the audio is digital on the disc, there is a converter, a DAC, digital analog converter, within the player that is going to turn that digital audio into analog audio and pump it out uh, through those little jacks. So it's pretty, it's pretty handy. If you have those two jacks, and you have a player compatible with digital and analog and have the remote, sometimes some of these uh, audio switching features are, were not on the front panels of the players and you need the remote. That's a key part of this whole dance is, is having a remote that can change from the analog to the digital tracks and choose right and left tracks and all that stuff. Um, so yes, yeah, so you could choose between the two and they would all pump out for through that analog out. Some players who were a little bit higher end also had an optical digital out and that would send out the raw PCM pulse code modulated digital sound and then you could let something else um, decode that and maybe like a receiver without more high end DAC. So basically it's one of those things is what's got the better DAC um, and then you know what is more capable at turning the digital sound into quality analog sound that goes to your speakers. Is it the laser disc player or your receiver or whatever else you have it hooked up to? Um, in most cases, it was probably some sort of outboard processor or decoder or, or an AVR or something like that. Um, so if you had a digital out, not only did that make you cool, um, even before the days of 5.1 surround sound, uh, but it also made you surprisingly future-proofed uh, when DTS would drop in 1997, which nobody even thought was going to be a thing in, you know, 1984, 85. Um, so those players are cool. Uh, if you have an older player that has a digital out later on, they would also add just coaxial digital outs, the same kind of coaxial digital outs you see on DVD players or whatever. You just hook up a good, like sturdy 75 ohm, you know, RCA jack cable to it. And, uh, that gives, you know, gives you another option. Some players had both which is cool. Um, so then, yes, that was a, a basic standard for the years. Like you had analog out, sometimes two, a lot of times two. So you could hook up like one going directly to a TV and one set going directly to a, a receiver. Very handy. I mean, even if you had two zones, you could have one going to one room, one going to another room. You could do whatever you want with it. It was pretty cool. They always had, uh, yeah, often had two video outs as well uh, to match. You could send one to like a VCR or something and one to a receiver. But anyways, I'm, I'm getting beside myself. Um, so that was a standard for quite some time. And surround sound encoded onto these discs was was a big thing. All the big heavy hitters, you know, films like The Abyss and everything like that that came out in the late 80s all had, you know, Dolby Surround. Die Hard was a big one to listen to. Uh, it was, a you know, the surround situation was pretty fascinating. It used the same technology that uh, theaters had used, uh, you know, multi-channel Theatrical audio had been a thing, you know, 70 millimeter films had it, you know, for quite some time. Uh, but a big breakthrough happened in the mid 70s when Dolby Stereo was added to films and films like Star Wars greatly benefited from it because it basically did the same thing. It had, you know, multiple audio options from a, you know, a stereo signal and that carried over well into home video. 
you could have a, just a stereo track just left and right and you had all this other information that had been encoded into it that your decoder uh, sometimes they were standalone units they were sold separately for quite some time and then dolby uh, started implementing them directly into receivers as you know dolby pro logic decoding um, but yeah they would take those stereo signals and uh you know split them up into multiple you know surrounds you could have a subwoofer you could have two surround sound speakers um yeah, and then a center channel, and it was pretty cool. So it was almost 5.1, except not discrete. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, so that was the standard until, yeah, 95, and then AC3 came. And LaserDisc, you know, continually astounds me because it's just this RF signal with all sorts of things hidden on it. There, you know, there's video at a certain frequency, there's audio at a certain frequency, and Dolby Digital was... Uh, you know, piggybacked into this analog format, they stole one of the analog audio channels to fit this um, 5.1 signal in there. It even had a little bit more bit rate than the theatrical version, which was uh, released in 1992 with Batman Returns as Dolby Stereo Digital. And there were a ton of different names kind of thrown out there uh, for yeah for a laser disc before they settled on ac3 and then yeah also dolby digital and then it yeah it changed throughout the years so uh just to confuse people sometimes your later discs would just say dolby digital on the front sometimes they say ac3 sometimes they say a3 ac3 dolby digital or whatever it, it's all pretty confusing but it's just basically an audio codec and it was a way to compress audio it's basically like one half of a cd so if you have like the left channel of a cd basically and you could squeeze 5.1 channels on there um it was kind of a big deal uh but at you know a bit of a loss it was you know definitely uh more compressed than when dts came out as as an option and the the glory about those pcm tracks that were on the laserdisc 2 and the digital age was that they were also uncompressed and and just gorgeous sounding so anyways uh, that became a quite a bit of a wave maker in 1995 because it piggybacked onto discs and uh, if you didn't have the capability to play AC3 discs that was fine. Uh, if you had a newer player with digital audio uh, you could just listen to the PCM digital tracks on there and they still sounded great. That's what I did for years. I bought tons of Dolby digital discs before I even had it. And uh, DTS were a little bit behind the curve and they came a few years later and ended up becoming more of a niche product uh, the discs are sought after now because one, they've usually got pretty crazy mixes. They have been, there have been accusations uh, thrown around at the the levels not being quite right, especially on early discs. Uh, surround levels are too hot on some discs, and some like Jurassic Park have a flaming hot um, surround subwoofer LFE channel. But then again, AC3 wasn't always uh, all roses either. Goldeneye has a pretty hefty uh, LFE track that's a little bloated. Um, but anyway, so. Not only that, but they were later pressings of movies pressed by really great plants like Kurure in Japan. So uh, those discs can go for a premium nowadays. That said, there's a decent amount of DTS discs that you can get for a reasonable rate. Uh, but AC3 is like the bang for your buck winner there. Um, but yes, it gets supremely complicated in terms of how do you hook all this stuff up? Uh, because you've got analog outputs, you've got digital audio, <laughs> You've got AC3 RF audio, and then you've got DTS. And some of this stuff kind of coincides with each other, and some of it doesn't. So if you have, say, an older player that just has analog audio outs, you can listen to stereo analog movie tracks. And throughout the years, it, it wasn't the same in Europe. Um, all my PAL discs are just digital audio. Uh, PAL discs didn't have the multiple audio options that we had here in the states with ntsc discs um so yeah mostly talking about american discs but in the proper video series i'm going to do about this at some point i'll i'll dig more into the pala aspects of it um but yes if you had those analog audio outs uh and you had a player built before 1984 you could listen to uh, the analog audio on discs and they maintained that on most discs in the future 
Um, so even if you bought, you know, say some, you know, a copy from 1996 and it didn't have an, <laughs> a commentary track on it, you could still listen to the Pro Logic encoded or the Dolby Surround encoded um, surround soundtrack from the analog tracks coming out of that. Then yes, once you hit 1984, if you had those same outputs, chances are they there was a built-in digital to analog converter in there so you could listen to digital discs you could listen to analog discs it doesn't matter the player was doing it all and converting it into stereo and then it was up to you whether or not you wanted to add on something to drag the surround sound out of it if it was a surround encoded film uh and that was you know a standard for quite some amount of years and then yes it got complicated in 1995 where you had a special ac3 rf out port and that needed to go to not a receiver uh, it needed to go to a demodulator to take that radio frequency information and demodulate it back into raw digital dolby digital data that a receiver would be able to understand so those little demodulators were a tricky part of the equation so AC3 was great and very easy to um, access and how it was piggybacked into the system, but the demodulator made it a little more difficult. Um, so you needed that little puppy in order to get the audio, whereas when DTS came a few years later, all you needed was one of those players, could have been a player all the way back to 1984, with an optical out um, to play just the digital audio. And instead of PCM, it would have DTS coherent acoustics on there. And uh, if you didn't have a, there's the problem, if you didn't have a receiver that was capable of decoding DTS, but was capable of decoding PCM tracks, and you had that you know, cord hooked up, uh, you put it on a DTS disc and you would hear static blaring from all your speakers. Um, likewise, if you were flipping through the channels of your AC3 disc and just happened to personally select the, uh, the analog channel that contained the signal and you didn't have it hooked up to a demodulator and you were just listening to the 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 audio outs the analog audio outs you would also hear static coming from there um but i mean it was it was kind of more of an issue with dts that you would put in a disc and it would just and possibly blow your speaker so um yeah if you want a player that does it all it's going to have to be a player from 95 and beyond and thankfully there were quite a few of them like you know the cld d704 will have analog outputs galore it'll have an ac3 rf out and it'll have digital outs sometimes uh you know you like i said before you could have a coaxial digital out and you could have a, a toss link optical out um so a lot of the dvl series will have it you know the higher end players um from 95 on we'll have it and then there were services that were able to add on modifications uh, you could still do it yourself too you could put it in an ac3 mod if you wanted um, and then they did add ac3 to some of the kind of midline players at the expense of the optical out they kind of took away the digital optical out and they added the rf so like a pioneer cld d504 would have ac3 but it wouldn't have a raw pcm output uh, sadly but there's a lot of options. So yes, if you want it all, you're gonna have to get a player from 1995 and beyond and still check the specs. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. So in the next video, we're gonna get into how to play ProLogic and, and set that up and then go on from there. So thanks for hanging out. Hope some of this made sense. Cheers.